This is a picture of me about age 10. It's one of my favorite childhood memories. Uh, some of it comes from a story that I believe in a prior sermon I had shared, but I want to take a look at a different aspect of it today. But really, this, this picture takes place immediately following a hockey game uh, that I played in as a kid. It was the championship game for our league. Uh, we had a really successful year. We were number one throughout the season, and we got to the championship game. We won that against the number two team. It was just a, a great, great memory, and it really holds significance to me because not only did we we win, uh, but I scored the winning goal of the game, that which we won two to one. Also, for me, it was a big deal because that was the only goal I scored the entire season. All year, I'd just been carrying this weight on me like I wasn't pulling my weight. I wasn't a, a, a real part of the team because I wasn't contributing uh, on the score sheet. And so finally, I had, had earned my, uh, my place on the team during when it was needed most. And uh, this is me holding the puck, the game puck, the team, and the coaches decided that I would get it just as a way to remember my accomplishment. It was just a really, really great time in my life. Uh, But what was really interesting was the puck itself kind of became this mythological piece in uh, in relation to the, the hockey association that I played for. It would carry meaning uh, far along into my life. In fact, I would get questions about this puck uh, up to my young uh, 20s. In fact, what would happen basically from here on out is I would get the question whenever people associated with it could come up to me. I wouldn't get like, hey, how are you doing today? Instead, I would get, do you still have the puck? To which even to today, I could say, yeah, I still have the puck. Uh, it, I think right now it's up at my parents' house in Washington, still in my childhood bedroom. But then it would be preceded uh, by a, another question, a follow-up question. Do you still sleep with the puck? And which I would say, absolutely not. Come on, I don't still sleep with a, with a hockey puck. But people would ask that question because the truth is, for a while, I did sleep with the puck, all right? For the first time, on a two days to a week, I took that puck everywhere. It was not leaving my side. I took it to school. It was in my backpack. I took it and sat down with it when I had dinner and breakfast and lunch. It went everywhere, including to me when I went to bed. I would hold it tight. I was not letting that thing go. It was my treasury. It was my precious. Um, It was everything to me. It represented so much of me earning my place. And uh, I don't, I don't want to over-spiritualize just like a little kid enjoying a cool moment in his life and, and treasuring kind of uh, this, this winning and, and earning his place. Uh, but that puck to me kind of became a representation of what was an issue in my life. See, I, didn't, I treasured the puck, but I, I think I treasured it in mostly a healthy way. But uh, I treasured hockey in a way that was not healthy. It became an object of my worship. It, it was something I held on tight uh, last last week in the series. We defined worship, uh, Pastor Jason and Jordan defined worship as a treasuring of God above all things that overflows into external acts of glorification. Now, uh, this is a proper view of worship. Worship can be a treasuring of really anything. And for me, for a period of my life, that was hockey. I treasured hockey above everything else. And I seemed to really try to glorify it by in all aspects of my life. It dominated my thoughts. It dominated my desires. Uh, Everything I wore, spoke about hockey. It's what I talked about. It's what people knew me for. It was an identity for me. So much so that when it was taken away from me, I had to quit because of concussions. I kind of just fell apart. I was a mess. Everything I had built my life around uh, was gone and I didn't know what to do. And what was really interesting and during all this is there was an aspect of me also worshiping God. I treasured God. I was a follower, but there was times in my life where they would battle for number one and way too often uh, hockey won out. It was my object of my worship. And so today I ask, as we head into the sermon, what do you treasure above all things? The same question Pastor Jason asked last week uh, is what we're going to be exploring today. And out of that question, immediately following that question, what do you worship? What do you worship? What are you worshiping today? Uh, Because it matters deeply. And so today we're going to keep unpacking that question, that idea about treasuring and worshiping. Uh, We're going to be looking at a couple passages in the Old Testament. We're going to be in Exodus. First, Exodus 32, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 6. And then we'll actually go backwards to kind of give some more context and understanding of it and understanding of worship. By looking at Exodus 20, we'll be looking at verses, I believe it's 3 through 7. So if you want to go ahead and open your Bible to Exodus 32. Um, this takes place in the middle of the story. And so to give so just some quick context to really 
fully understand everything that's going on here. I just want to kind of sum up really quickly the beginning of Exodus. If you were with us during the summer, uh, this last summer, summer 2023, we went through it through the entire uh, entirety of the summer. We went through 19 chapters of Exodus, really pulling out who is God. I know not everybody was there every week or, or at all. Some of you weren't even a part of the church at that point. Uh, so if you're interested, you can go back online and look at those, or you can just open your Bible and read the first 19 chapters. But really to sum it up, we have the nation of God, Israel, who uh, God now has, is going to redeem, and he chooses Moses. He calls Moses uh, to be his representation, his mediator between God and Israel in, in Egypt. And he performs all of these miracles that uh, eventually lead to uh, Israel fleeing, being released from captivity, from slavery. They go across the desert. They cross the Red Sea. There's miracle upon miracle, and they get to the other side of the Red Sea, finally getting their freedom. Uh, they praise God, and then they fall into the cycle of grumbling and complaining, and God providing for them, including water and food. And they arrive at Mount Sinai, which is part of the promise, not the fulfillment fully of the promise that God has for them when they will uh, reach the promised land. But this is kind of an in-between God saying, this will be a marker moment in this. They arrive at Mount Sinai. They experience the presence of God. Uh, and that's where we left off in the series. And then uh, picking up from there, he just starts establishing them as his nation, his holy people, to be a representation throughout all the earth of God on earth. And he just established them, gives them all these rules and regulations of what that's going to look like. And then we come to uh, Exodus 32. And in Exodus 32, what we see is the nation of Israel um, kind of falling apart. They fall apart as they, uh, as they, in how they choose to worship. And it really reveals something about Israel, but really a greater revelation about all people through all time. And it's that this, that we will worship. What we see here with Israel and what it says about us as people is that we will worship. I would actually go a step further than that. Uh, it's not directly in the passage. I can't even point to it a specific point in any part of scripture, but when you take it as a whole, what, what, and this isn't my idea, this is scholars and, and staff members, even staff members here at Family Church would often point to is not just we will worship, but we were created to worship, that we, uh, that God made us, and part of us is this innate desire and need to worship uh, in, in its fullness and in the right way, it would be God, but of course there can be a worship of anything. But what we see is that we will at all times worship. That is just a normal thing that humans will do at all times is we will move towards worship. So we see Exodus 32 verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. So what's happening here? Moses has come down. He's interacted with Israel as a representation from God. He's, he's given them all these laws and rules. Israel has agreed to be God's people. He's, they've established a covenant with him. And to summarize it really simply, uh, they will be his holy people on the earth to reveal him to all the nations and in that God will bless them as they keep his commandments, uh, but also they will, he will curse them when they disobey uh, with the idea that he will drive them back to uh, repentance and, and living according to his will. Uh, and ultimately uh, through this nation will come the Messiah. So that's, that's what this, this covenant that he's established with them. And then Moses goes back up the mountain to go commune with God. And where we pick up, uh, he's gone in total for 40 days and 40 nights. This is right towards the end. We, I don't know that we have the exact day, but it's, let's just say about day 38. So Moses has been gone for quite a long time and they're kind of panicking. They're not really sure what to do. Uh, and it says, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up. Oh, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So here they are, the, the, the people of Israel, God's chosen people, go to now the second in command, Aaron. He's Moses' right-hand man through all of this, this, uh, this, this, this series of miracles and, and redemption. And they go to Aaron and say, hey, Aaron, we need gods. We need a visual representation. We want to worship. Uh, again, I believe they are created. We are created to worship. Give us an object for us to pour out our affection upon. Give us something to point our worship towards. 
Uh, they, 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 they go to write what they need, what we all need is something to worship. And so Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your, your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. So Aaron gets this, uh, this pleading from the people of Israel to, to fashion uh, this, this image of God for them. And he, he gives in, he does what he's not supposed to. He builds this, this golden calf. He builds it for them. And interestingly enough, what we'll see or what happens immediately following this, God grows angry. He doesn't like this. And when Aaron is confronted, funny enough, he says, uh, well, really, I just threw the gold in the fire and this calf just, this is just what came out of it. Um, it's just a really interesting response from Aaron and really kind of highlights uh, mankind's response to sin. It's unwillingness to accept responsibility from its sin. Really what we see with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Adam's like, uh, it wasn't my fault. It was the woman's fault you gave me. And here we find now Aaron, in essence, doing the same thing. It's not my fault. It's, uh, it's the fire's fault. I just threw stuff in there and it produced the idol. Really, it's God's fault because it's God's fire. So uh, thanks a lot, God, for, for me doing the wrong thing. Um, completely wrong. And uh, maybe someday we'll figure out the correct thing to scapegoat our sin on past responsibility. So he goes on and he says, Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. They, 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 what Israel has done is created now this idol that will receive their worship. And how this was always explained to me from the moment I was a young child in Catholic school was what they were doing was creating a God or gods that was this golden calf. They were literally bringing forth a new God they were abandoning Yahweh. Uh, they were like, yeah, you've been gone 40 days and 40 nights. We don't know what to do. So uh, we're just gonna, we're creating something new for us to follow. But what, when you read through it, what I've come to believe is not that they were abandoning Yahweh per se. Uh, they were just, they wanted something to point their affection, their worship towards. Uh, up to this point, they've had God. He's performing all these miracles. They've seen him at the mountain. They have all the things he's given them. They even have Moses at the time. He's their mediator. They have something in a sense to point their worship towards. And now that's disappeared. And so they want something. So what they've asked Aaron to do is bring forth this representation of Yahweh to lead them now to the promised land. And, and, and what you see in these six verses really points that out. Uh, he always, throughout all of it, talks about uh, the Lord. Uh, even their feast isn't to a new God, it's still to a Lord. And when we see the four letters capitalized, it's Yahweh. They're still worshiping Yahweh. Uh, it's just in a now interesting form of Yahweh, which I would argue is no longer Yahweh at all. But it's not like they've completely abandoned it. And when you look at their immediate asking of Aaron, request, they say, make for us these gods. And uh, the word there is Elohim, which is the plural form of God, uh, but it's also how God is, Yahweh is referred to in the Old Testament in the plural form as well, pointing to uh, him being a triune God, three persons in one. So it doesn't seem like they're just completely abandoning Yahweh. They just want this physical representation. They want to worship something and it is, it is true for each and every one of us. We, at our core, want to worship. We will worship something. And really the question of all that is, what will we worship? I was having an interesting conversation with Pastor Craig. Uh, he's a campus pastor up in Sutherland, but also our missions pastor. And something he said that really interested me was as he's done missions, what he has observed and what uh, missionaries across the world have observed is they don't have to convince people in the cultures to worship. That's just the natural bent of humans. What they have to work on is who these people worship. They are already worship. They just worship the wrong thing. And this response 
of Israel to, to Moses being gone for 40 days. Uh, angers God greatly. He's really just disappointed. He's hurt by this people who he has redeemed. Um, but it's not a surprise to God. This isn't a surprise. I would argue that nothing is a surprise to God. He's all knowing and he exists at time, outside of time and space. Uh, it doesn't surprise him. And in fact, what we see if we go back about 12 chapters is God has been preparing the nation of Israel for this. He's been pointing them with the expectation that this will happen. And he's been pointing them to a different direction. When he establishes his covenant with him, with, with Israel, excuse me, he points out, who deserves worship? That is a, a, really the first thing that God is concerned with when he establishes the nation of Israel. What we look at in this is the first thing he gives them, he gives them these 10 commandments. And what God is doing, he's literally establishing a nation. He's not just establishing a religion at that point in time. Uh, and, and a lot of cultures at the time, those things were intimately connected. You couldn't separate them. The government and the religion were, this, uh, were in essence the same thing. He's teaching this people who were enslaved to another nation how to be their own nation. He's establishing laws and boundaries and guidelines for them. He's caring for them. He's, he's establishing a government. He's establishing their system of worship. He gives them the Ten Commandments as the basis for what their nation will look like. Uh, in, in the terms of the United States. In a sense, what he's doing, it's not a perfect analogy. He's giving them a constitution. He's giving them their bill of rights. He's saying, this is the very foundation of you as a people, you as a people who worship Yahweh. And, and this is going to, to form and dictate all the other laws and regulations. It's gonna dictate how you live. It's gonna dictate how you represent uh, God amongst the, the lost of the world. He, he's giving them the very foundation. And he's doing this uh, not just to establish rules, but he's doing this because he realized that it is what is best for not just the nation of Israel, but ultimately for us. So he, he, the first one he gives in verse three, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the very first commandment that he gives them. And uh, not all of them are done in order of importance, but the first one is in fact the most important commandment. It is the one that all the other commandments all the other rules and regulations would point back to, but also flow out of. In essence, what he says to them is, uh, all these other rules, they may be good, they may be important, but if you miss this first one, none of them really matter. None of them really matter. He kind of, uh, what we see throughout history, what we saw King Solomon saying, like uh, all things apart from God are meaningless. And God says, hey, if you don't start here with having me as your only God, all these other things are ultimately gonna lead to your ruin. And God understands that. He understands how we're created. He's pointing to that, right? Uh, and what he's, what he's saying is, in essence, you shall worship no other gods because when you worship something other than God, you're no longer pointed to relationship and life and prosperity, but instead pointed to sin and death and destruction. In all things, this is true. So he says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall worship no other gods. The only God, the only thing, the only person worthy of our worship, of their worship is Yahweh. And it has this weird clause at the end. It says, before me, which has sometimes led to some really weird theology, some, some bad interpretation. I've heard it and explored it through my younger ages. Like, is this meaning uh, you can have objects of worship, you can have God secondary to God, as long as God is number one. Uh, this isn't to establish an order, a list. What he's saying is, you are to have no other objects of worship amongst me. There are no other gods. He is the only one true God. He's the only one deserving of praise. He's the only one deserving of worship, that he should be number one, but he should also be the only one. He is, Yahweh is, the only one deserving of worship. But he continues on, he gives more commandments. Of course, there's 10 commandments. The first four can be summed up as, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, your soul. And then the, the last six, you shall uh, love your neighbor as yourself. But in the second one, what he's doing is he's pointing now right back to the first one. It says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. 
For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So he gives this second commandment, which is, 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 is completely tied to the first. He says them, if you summarize it, <clears throat> you shall have no false idols or no graven images. And this is a commandment uh, when I was growing up that I think for a lot of us, when we were growing up, how it was kind of explained to us is we're not to create idols of false gods. We're not to create idols at all, whether they're physically represented or not, uh, which is a good rule to live by is certainly true, uh, but I would actually point back to that's mostly true of uh, pointing to the first commandment, not necessarily the second commandment, because what God's getting at is something even deeper than that. He's really uh, continuing to define who deserves worship, and he's pointing back to himself. What he's saying is, we are not in Israel, and still for us, I would say today, the principle directly ties, is that that we are not to create images of God at all. Because what God understands, what God knows about it, is when we create images of him, they will always, always, always be lesser versions of him. There's no way to capture the magnificence, the wonder of God in anything man-made. And what will happen is when we attempt to do that, it's always going to fall well short. It's always going to paint a picture of God that is, that is insufficient, that is lesser. And God says, only I get to, to get to paint a picture of who I am. Don't ever attempt it because you're going to get it wrong. And he, he knows this is important because what will happen is when we start to even worship this, what the thing represents, when we start to worship this, this picture, this lesser image, what it will start to do is distort our image of God who he actually is. We will, all, we will start to slip into default back to what is in front of us. And we will have a lesser image of who God is. And at some point, I would argue, when you start to misrepresent God, when you start to twist his characteristics or assign different characteristics or, or whatever it may be, we eventually and, and pretty quickly start to not even worship Yahweh or Jesus at all. We start to worship something that is no longer him. And beyond that, what he's getting at is an understanding of a people who were created to worship, who will worship. What we will do time after time is we will stop worshiping what the object represents and we will start worshiping the object itself. And so God says, don't worship any idols or statues, even if they're of me because they will always, always be lesser versions of me. And he doesn't want us to worship a lesser version of him. He wants us to worship exactly who he is in all his magnificence and wonder. And he goes, he, he continues kind of down this line of thought as he goes to the third commandment. He says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, this, 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 <clears throat> this commandment uh, was always explained to me for the longest time simply as uh, don't use profanity and, and God in the same phrase or sentence that is taking the Lord's name in vain. And I do believe there's something true about that. I don't, I don't think that we should just toss that out, but that's like a very, very base level understanding of the depth of what God is getting at here. Because what he's saying to Israel and something we can carry forth is he's really calling them not to misrepresent God uh, in, in how we speak. Don't, don't twist his characteristics. Don't add things to him. Don't take them away. Don't attribute to God the, the things of man that are not of him. Don't say, I'm doing this in the name of God when really you're doing it not for God at all, but you're doing it for yourself. He's deeply concerned about how he is represented, not just amongst his people, but amongst the lost who, who desperately need to know him. And he's saying, when you do that, you will, you will paint a picture of God that will lead to a worship of a God that is no longer Yahweh. It will be a misrepresentation or again, a lesser version of God. And at some point, very quickly again, it becomes not rep worshiping God at all. And so he says, do not take my lame in vain because you will paint a picture of me 
that isn't true. And then I will not be worshiped. Something else will be worshiped. Through it all, God is concerned about us worshiping him and him alone. Again, understanding that we will worship. We were created to worship. We will worship. And that it's important that we worship only him. Again, because when we worship anything else, it leads us to death and destruction. We see that all through the Old Testament, time and time again, even in the garden. As soon as we worship something else, including and often ourselves, it always, always ends in catastrophe. It always points us farther away from God, which is what we need more than anything. There's a, there's a, there's a guy, uh, <clears throat> just a really interesting guy. His name is David Foster Wallace. He is a uh, he, was a, he was an author. He wrote a couple books. He uh, really was a poster child for the postmodernist movement. In fact, I would say they, at some level, idolized him and worshipped him. And it was interestingly enough, uh, ironically, he was also a guy who, who uh, was its harshest critic. And this movement, this philosophy, this mindset, amongst other things, amongst other things, rejected God. It said, well, we don't believe in God. In fact, we don't even need God. God is an outdated idea that uh, really is for weak people. We're beyond that. We don't need him for morals or for salvation. Uh, in fact, uh, some of it would say there's no such thing as good and evil. Things are just things. Uh, really, just a complete rejection of God in all the ways of God. And here he is, this David Foster Wallace. He's just, a, again, an interesting guy. He, he battled depression for his whole life. He de- battled addictions. He was addicted at points to marijuana and alcohol. And he would say television, uh, just mindless entertainment. He, and uh, uh, sadly, he took his life uh, when he was 46 years old. I believe it's 2008 uh, as he battled this. Uh, but there are people uh, who believe that he changed his beliefs along the line, that he was a self-proclaimed agnostic, uh, that some say while he attended uh, a rehab in one of his stints that he would become a follower of Christ. Uh, there's some debate about that. But this guy, he was interesting. He was an incredibly talented author and an incredibly talented speaker. He was invited at one point to, to give the commencement speech at Kenyon College, which is a, a liberal arts college. And it's just this incredibly powerful speech uh, called This Is Water. It's just, it's really, if you listen to it, it's, it's just a master of his craft, maybe giving his magnum opus. It's, it's, it's incredible. And in it, what he's telling them to this, this graduating class is the value of their degree. He, he goes through, it's not, it's not what you've learned, but what, that you've learned how to learn and how to think and how to challenge ideas. Really kind of summing up his belief of what this liberal arts degree is about. But then he gets towards the end and he has a part that is really seemingly out of place, particularly for the people who's speaking to this, this group that is mostly comprised of people in the postmodern movement, a people who, who reject God. And he, it's not out of uh, the train of thought, but it is interesting. He says, this, I submit, is the freedom of a real education, of learning how to be well-adjusted. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. You get to decide what to worship. Because here's something else that's weird but true. In the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Here's a guy who, who is a part of this culture that says there's no God, there's no such thing, our need for religion. Worship is an outdated idea. And he comes back after experiencing that. This is about three years before he tragically takes his own life. And he says, there's no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as worship. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And this is where, again, he's likely not a believer if at this point or at all, he says, and the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it Jesus Christ or Allah, be it Yahweh or the wicked mother goddess or the four noble truths or some inviolable set of ethical principles. Like he's just right there. He just touches the truth. And again, he misses it, unfortunately. Is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will have, never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. 
And with time and age starts showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. The whole trick is keeping the truth up front in daily consciousness. That is, it is important that we are intentional about what we worship. Worship power, you will end up feeling weak and afraid and you will never, have, excuse me, you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect being seen as smart. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful. Again, I, I disagree there. I do think there's something to that. These things are just things. Uh, they're not good or evil, money, sex, uh, uh, looks, wealth, whatever they are. They're, they're just things. They are evil and sinful when we misuse them and certainly when we worship them. But what he says is they're unconscious. They are default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day, getting more and more select about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. Here's a man who is fully engrossed in a lifestyle, who has lived it, who has seen all the evil of what the world has to offer, has really uh, spoken and written about, uh, about it all. And he comes to the conclusion that in the end, the idea that there's no such thing as, 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 as God, that, 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 that there's no such thing as worship just isn't true. That each and every person who has ever walked this earth worships something that you just have to, to choose what it is to worship. That we will all choose to worship. You will either choose it on purpose or you will choose it subconsciously, but we will all worship and to be intentional about worship. And he almost gets it right. He touches on all these religious ideas. He touches Jesus Christ and Yahweh. He misses the ultimate truth, but he understands that worship is a core part of the human condition. There's no escaping it. And he says, when we worship anything else, Right? It will eat us alive. What God says it, to his people, the nation of Israel, in a sense that if you don't worship me, it will always lead to death and destruction. You will worship. What are you worshiping? And, I, and that's the question I, I have for us today. What are you worshiping? What do you treasure? What leads to this external acts of glorification? What are you worshiping? And I'm speaking, of course, to you guys as family church. We're a church who, who declares that we follow Jesus Christ. And my hope for most of us, I believe it's true for most of us, is we have chosen to follow him, which means we have chosen to worship him. And we recognize most of the time, although we're not perfect, we slip into it. We are marred again by sin that we recognize that power and wealth and sex and, and, and looks and all of these things are not worthy of our worship. In fact, they are, they are bad to worship. But I think what has happened for a lot of us, what I worry for the church, what I worry for society that, that kind of adopts the ways of God, even though they don't have relationship necessarily with God, what we sometimes do, and it plays out in politics, it plays out in culture, it plays out across everything in our lives, is we don't necessarily worship these things, although those things happen a lot. What we also worship is a lesser version of God. We worship a lesser version of God, which ultimately can become not God at all. And so my question I ask, what do you worship? Are you worshiping God exactly how he is? Are you worshiping a lesser version of him? Are you worshiping the God who, who says he values life? Like it is, it is one of those most treasured things. He values life. He values life so much that he values life even at the point of conception. He, he forms us in our mother's womb. It is, it, is, it is something he loves and wants us to love. And we take that and we, and we, and we support it. We support uh, groups. We support places like the Hope Clinic or we, it changes how we vote. We vote anti-abortion as a church whole. Do you worship a God that values life to the point where he says, yeah, I, I, I definitely value it uh, from the point of conception, but he also values it from the cradle to the grave who says you are to care for and love the orphan and the widow. Do you worship a God? Do you worship a God who for us men says, I believe uh, <clears throat> that 
He takes us and he says, you have a specific role in the household. You are the head of the household. And what that, I believe that means mostly is that we have responsibility not just for ourselves, but for the spiritual well-being of our family as well. And with that, he says, you are to be honored and respected. Do you worship that God? Because for me, that, right, that, that, that's great for me. But, but do, I also, do we also worship a God that says at the same time, uh, he, 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 values, he values women at the same level, that he has created them as equal image bearers of himself who have innate value and who are as well supposed to be honored and loved and cared for and valued and sacrificed for. Do you worship a God who says, honor your mother and father? Who for a lot of you have heard your stories, right? That it can be the hardest thing possible. But for a lot of us here today, we are mothers and fathers. And so we are the immediate beneficiary for that. So it's really easy for a worship to God who says, ultimately, uh, you are worthy of honor because of your position in your family. And so your kids, you should expect that. You should desire that. It's not wrong. But do you worship a God who says, not just honor mother and father, but as we looked at in Philippians, honor the emperor, which at the time was Nero, a man putting Christians to death, chasing them down like dogs, torturing them, putting them to death for sport, uh, a God who says, love your enemies and bless those who persecute you. Because all of those gods, they're the same God. And he calls us to worship him and for all who he is and all of what he calls us to do and for us to not just worship those in word, but in action. Do we worship God exactly how he is or have we created a lesser version of him? Who do you treasure? What do you treasure? And who do you worship? I'm going to go ahead and release the campus pastors. I love you guys. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sticking around today. And for a transformational moment, I just want to wrestle what we talked about today. Uh, are you worshiping a lesser version of God? Is there somewhere in your life that you have misattributed things to God, mischaracterized him, uh, valued parts of him and kind of put the other parts back on the shelf. Uh, just, I ask you to take kind of an inventory of your life, of your worship, and just look, are you really worshiping God exactly who he is? Are you worshiping Yahweh? Are you worshiping Jesus Christ exactly as the version of, of God that he has presented and revealed to us? And if not, um, what needs to change in your life? Where do you need to correct course? Where do you need to change your belief to match up to what God says uh, through his revelation, through scripture? Thank you and uh, have a good day.